Well, what's wonderful about the Lewis Chessmen is that they appeal to just about every civilizational culture in the world, and this really is a consequence of the universal appeal of chess. Most people are familiar at least with the game, even if they don't play it. The transmission of chess across the world really began around the 5th century AD in India. We think the game was invented by a single person, but of course we don't know who that person was. So the original uh, representation of pieces on the board would reflect the four orders of the Indian army, and that would be the king, the general, the elephant riders, and the uh, charioteers. When the chess game moves west, into Europe, it begins to reflect the order of feudal society. So we have king, queen, bishop, knight, the most important members of medieval society. Now the elephant is one of the most interesting pieces. As the game migrated across Persia and through the Islamic territories of North Africa, it became an abstract figure, and this is all to do really with the uh, edict against representing animals or humans figuratively in uh, uh, Islamic art. Um, this is an elephant. These two protuberances actually represent the two riders who would have been riding the elephant into battle. They're quite important from the point of view of understanding uh, the European pieces because the two, these two points become the points of the bishop's mitre. So the elephant becomes the bishop in the European Christian game, which is represented on this piece from the Lewis chessmen. If chess is a war game, why is a bishop really a custodian of peace and love? Why is this bishop on the chessboard? Well, in fact, in the Middle Ages, the bishop had a much more varied role in society. Bishops were very often feudal lords in their own right. They commanded great territories. They had to protect those territories. They were very often connected to the royal family. And of course, when the um, period of crusade emerges in the late 11th century, bishops are very often uh, leading troops into battle. So although it may be seen as a... Uh, a slightly um, strange thing to have this, this, this character on the chessboard. In fact, in terms of the medieval experience, it's absolutely perfectly fitting. Of all the pieces on the chessboard, the knight is the one that figures in each different culture that chess emerges in. And this example here is a little knight that's been influenced very much by the abstract form of the knight that's, that's popular in Islamic society. It's the face here that has uh, the signifier for the horse, this pointed triangular shape is meant to be indicative of the horse's muzzle and you can see the two little round dots that signify the eyes. When chess becomes Christianized, it brings with it certain moral judgments. So oddly enough, although it might seem strange to a modern audience, Chess was considered a rather racy, illicit game. It was forbidden certain orders of society, so clerics, bishops, priests weren't allowed to play chess. And it was very, very closely associated with gambling, prostitution even, but with really moral decline. And there's always a good reason why something's forbidden. That means that someone's doing it. And of course, all of these religious types were very avid chess players. And in the end, the edict that prevents them from playing chess is more or less uh, absolved by the 13th century, because essentially, people just want to play this game.